A very good evening aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought you by Shankaraya's academy. Aspirants, due to cyclone and its effects in Chennai, we did not able to publish the news analysis video for the past 3 days, but do not worry, we will cover the important news articles from those days newspaper in the upcoming news analysis video. With this information, let us get into the daily news analysis. Today, I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspapers dated 3rd and 6th of December 2023. Displayed here is a list of topics that we will be discussing today. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So, try to watch the entire video. And a kind request to you all aspirants, those who have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular updates about our country face videos. Now, let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this news article. This article is taken from 3rd December newspaper. This article talks about World Malaria Report 2023 that was released recently. This report was released by World Health Organization that is WHO. According to the report, in 2022, India contributed to 66% of malaria cases in Southeast Asia. The report further says that nearly 46% of all cases in the Southeast Asia region were caused by the parasite called Plasmodium vivax. Okay, this is the crux of the news article given here. Now, in this context, let us understand the basics about malaria disease and then we will see the important data mentioned in the World Malaria Report 2023. Now, first let us take malaria. See, malaria is a mosquito borne blood disease caused by the Plasmodium parasites. See, there are several types of Plasmodium parasites which causes malaria. The most severe type of malaria is caused by Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. Okay. Now, how malaria is transmitted? The Plasmodium parasites that cause malaria are transmitted to humans through the bite of infected female Anopheles mosquitoes. So, malaria is basically transmitted through the bite of female Anopheles mosquitoes. See, these mosquitoes bite primarily between dusk and dawn. The transmission can also occur through blood transfusion, organ transplant or the shared use of needles or syringes contaminated with infected blood. Okay. This is how malaria transmits. Now, what are the symptoms of malaria? See, the symptoms of malaria usually appear 10 to 15 days after the mosquito bite. The symptoms include fever, headache, chills and vomiting. Here note that without effective treatment, the malaria can progress to severe illness and often lead to death. Okay. So, this is all about the symptoms. Now, moving on to say about the geographical distribution of malaria disease. See, malaria occurs mostly in tropical and subtropical regions. Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest share of global malaria burden. However, the malaria also exists in parts of Asia, Latin America and some parts of the Middle East. Okay. Now, moving on to say about the preventive measures available to prevent malaria. See, till now, no malaria vaccine has met the WHO's efficacy benchmark of 75% efficiency. But a vaccine named RTSS got WHO's approval despite its lower efficacy of around 30 to 40%. Here note that RTSS is the first malaria vaccine developed by collaboration of GlaxoSmithKline and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. See, Ghana and Nigeria have given approval for the use of RTSS vaccine in their countries. Apart from this RTSS vaccine, Oxford University has developed a vaccine called R21 which is awaiting WHO approval. This vaccine is also similar to RTSS vaccine. Okay. Now coming to India, see Bharat Biotech has received a license to produce the RTSS vaccine in India. Apart from this, the Serum Institute of India is involved in manufacturing of R21 vaccine. Okay. So, this is all about the vaccines available to treat malaria. Now, moving on to say about global efforts to eliminate malaria. The first important effort is Global Malaria Program. This program was launched by the World Health Organization and it is responsible for coordinating global efforts to control and eliminate malaria. The work of the Global Malaria Program is guided by the Global Technical Strategy for Malaria 2016 to 2030. 
okay so this is the first important effort the second important effort is e2025 initiative in 2021 the world health organization launched the e2025 initiative this initiative aims to halt the transmission of malaria in 25 identified countries by the year of 2025 okay and the third important effort is malaria elimination initiative it was launched by bill and melinda gates foundation this initiative focuses on eliminating malaria by increasing access to effective treatments this initiative also aims in reducing the mosquito population and developing new tools and technologies to combat malaria disease okay so these are all some of the global efforts to eliminate malaria now we shall see the efforts taken in india to prevent malaria the first important step is national malaria control program this program was launched in 1953 and it was built around three key activities they include insecticidal residual spray with dtd monitoring and surveillance of cases and treatment of patients see this program is continuously working to eliminate malaria the second important effort is national vector borne disease control program see this is an umbrella program for prevention and control of vector borne diseases like malaria japanese encephalitis dengue chikungunya kala azar and lymphatic filariasis so this program also prevents the spread of malaria the third important step is national framework for malaria elimination 2016 2030 see this framework is created based on the who's global technical strategy for malaria 2016 to 2030 the main goals of the national framework for malaria elimination include elimination of indigenous cases of malaria throughout the india by 2030 then maintaining malaria free status in areas where malaria transmission has been interrupted and preventing reintroduction of malaria so these are the main goals that india aims to achieve through national framework for malaria elimination 2016 2030 okay so this is all about india's efforts in preventing malaria now finally let us see the important highlights from the world malaria report 2023 and note that this report was released by the world health organization now first we shall look at the global data the report reveals that there was an increase in global malaria cases with an estimated 249 million cases in 2022 surpassing pre pandemic levels the report says that some of the reasons such as covid-19 disruptions drug resistance humanitarian crisis and climate change they pose threats to the global malaria response and according to the report four countries such as nigeria democratic republic of the congo uganda and mozambique accounts for almost half of all malaria cases globally okay this is all about the global data now we shall see the data that is specific to india according to the report in 2022 india accounted for 66 percentage of malaria cases in southeast asia region plasmodium vivax a protozoal parasite contributed to almost 46 percentage of cases in india the report notes that despite a 55 percentage reduction in cases since 2015 india remains a significant contributor to the global malaria burden also the report says that india and indonesia accounted for about 94 percentage of all malaria deaths in the southeast asia region okay so these are all some of the important highlights mentioned in the world malaria report 2023 so you can use these points while writing main answer this will definitely enrich your main answer and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion is about the basics about malaria disease and then we saw some findings from the world malaria report 2023 now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article it says that the severe cyclonic storm mikjong made a landfall close to the south of andhra pradesh the landfall was made with a maximum sustained wind speed of about 9200 km per hour the cyclonic storm has created a widespread destruction in both tamil nadu and andhra pradesh okay this is all about the news now in this context let us understand some important points about tropical cyclone from exam perspective the tropical cyclones are violent storms that originate over oceans or seas in the tropical areas the tropical cyclones are intense low pressure areas that are confined only between 30 degree north and 
30 degree south latitudes of the world. Know that the tropical cyclones are called by various names in various parts of the world. They are called cyclones in the Indian Ocean. Then hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. Then typhoons in the Western Pacific and South China Sea. And it is called willy willies in the Western Australia. Okay. This is all about the basics of cyclone. Now coming to the conditions for the formation of tropical cyclones. See there are five major conditions that are favorable for the formation and intensification of tropical cyclones. Now we will see them one by one. Firstly, large sea surface with temperature higher than 27 degrees Celsius is needed for the formation of tropical cyclones. Secondly, the presence of Coriolis force is essential for the formation of tropical cyclones. Now what is this Coriolis force? See the Coriolis force is an apparent force caused by Earth's rotation. To put it simply, the rotation of the Earth about its axis affects the direction of the wind. Here the force which is responsible for affecting the direction of wind is called Coriolis force. Note that the Coriolis force has a great impact on the direction of wind movement. That is why it is one of the major conditions favorable for the cyclone formation. Okay, This is the second condition. Then the third condition is small variations in the vertical wind speed in the ocean areas. This means that there won't be any high variations in the vertical wind speed. And fourthly, a pre-existing weak low pressure area or low level cyclonic circulation is essential for the formation of tropical cyclones. And finally, upper divergence above the sea level system is needed for the formation of tropical cyclone. Okay, So these are the five conditions that are favorable for the formation and intensification of tropical cyclones. Now let us see the stages of tropical cyclones. See there are generally three stages associated with tropical cyclones. Now let us see them one by one. Now first let us take the formation stage. Basically the cyclone is formed due to the condensation process. The condensation is the process through which water vapor in the air is converted into liquid water. This condensation process only helps in cloud formation. So the condensation process along with the five conditions which we saw just now encourages the formation of vertical cumulonimbus clouds surrounding the center of the storm. This led to the formation of cyclones. See with the continuous supply of moisture from the sea, the storm is further strengthened. This is all about the formation stage. Now coming to the mature stage, a mature tropical cyclone is characterized by the strong spirally circulating wind around the center of the cyclone. Know that the center of the cyclone is called the eye. The eye is a region of calm with subsiding air. Around the eye region there is the eye wall. In the regions of the eye wall there is a strong spiraling ascent of air to a greater height which can reach up to the tropopause. See the wind reaches maximum velocity in the eye wall region reaching as high as 250 km per hour. Then from the eye wall the rain bands will radiate and clouds may drift into the outer region of the storm. This makes the cyclone very stronger. Okay, This is what happens in the mature stage of tropical cyclone. Then comes the final dissipation stage. As we saw earlier, the cyclones that formed in oceans or seas will tend to move over the coastal areas or land. So after the maturation, the cyclonic system moves slowly about 300 to 500 km per day over the coastal areas. And while reaching the coastal areas, the cyclones no longer get sufficient energy from warm ocean waters. Therefore, the moisture supply to the cyclone storm is cut off and finally the cyclonic storm dissipates. Know that the place where a tropical cyclone crosses the coast is called the landfall of the cyclone. Okay, So this is all about the cyclone. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about the conditions that are favorable for the formation of tropical cyclones and we saw the stages involved in tropical cyclones. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article talks about a report titled The Global Climate 2011 to 2020, a decade of acceleration. This report was recently released by the World Meteorological Organization that is WMO. The report shows that the decade of 2011 to 2020 is the warmest ever decade which was recorded in history. 
at the same time the report notes that 2011 to 2020 decade saw the lowest number of deaths from extreme heat events okay this is the crux of the news article given here now in this discussion let us see the important findings from the wmo report and we will see the basics about world meteorological organization now first let us take the findings of the report firstly the report says that 2011 to 2020 decade was the first decade since 1950 where there was no single extreme event with 10000 deaths or more the wmo says that this improvement was due to the early warning system better forecasting and better disaster management by the countries secondly the report shows that this was the first decade that the depleted ozone hole has showed some recovery but at the same time the report warned that the glaciers around the world were thinned by approximately 1 meter per year on an average between 2011 and 2020 the report gives a shocking fact that the greenland and antarctica lost 38 percentage of more ice during the 2011 to 2020 period than during the 2001 to 2010 period okay this is the second important findings of the report thirdly the report shows that human caused climate change significantly increased the risks from extreme heat events know that the report shows that the heat waves are responsible for the highest number of human deaths while tropical cyclones were responsible for the most economic damage and finally the report talked about the climate finance the report shows that the public and private climate finance almost doubled during the 2011 to 2020 period however the report highlighted that the funds should be increased at least seven times by the end of this decade to achieve limiting the global temperature from rising beyond 1.5 degrees celsius by the end of this 21st century okay this all about the important findings of the report now before concluding our discussion let us see some basics about world meteorological organization which is shortly called as wmo see wmo is one of the specialized agencies of the united nations it was established in 1950 this organization got originated from the international meteorological organization wmo is headquartered in geneva switzerland the wmo performs various functions like coordinating the meteorological activities of various member countries then publishing statistics on meteorology then predicting the event of locust swarms etc here note that the world meteorological organization currently has 187 member countries from exam point of view note that the wmo releases two reports they are greenhouse gas bulletin and status of the world climate okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw the important findings of the recently released wmo report titled the global climate 2011 to 2020 a decade of acceleration and then we saw some points regarding the world meteorological organization now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about the super cyclonic storm migjong and its effect on chennai city see raining due to migjong cyclone started on december 3rd and by the next morning most areas in chennai had recorded more than 120 mm of rainfall and few areas have recorded more than 250 mm of rainfall see this natural calamity exposed the other side of poor administration in chennai this article highlights that the power in the city was shut down for almost 2 days then water stagnated on almost all roads in chennai and storm water drains were choked with plastic trash see all these problems highlight the menace of urban flooding and the poor investment in infrastructure in chennai so this editorial article tries to say that the cyclone migjong alone was not responsible for the chennai trouble but also the poor administration okay this is the crux of the editorial given here in this background let us understand some points about urban flooding its causes and some steps to prevent urban flooding we will understand this topic using mains answer rating approach the question is urban flooding is one of the inevitable disasters in the cities of india in this slide discuss the causes of urban floods in india and suggest some practical solutions to tackle urban flooding 
150 words 10 marks see this question can be asked in general studies paper 3 under the syllabus disaster management now coming to the question see this is a very straightforward question we have to write the causes of urban flooding and then we have to suggest some steps to prevent urban flooding now we'll straight away get into the introduction part since the question is about urban flooding we can write the definition of urban floods in the intro part we can also write the definition given by some familiar agencies now let us see the definition given by national disaster management authority that is ndma according to ndma urban flooding is the inundation of land or property in a built environment particularly in most densely populated areas like cities the flooding is caused by excessive rainfall overwhelming the capacity of drainage systems in urban areas okay see this is the ndma definition of urban flooding to say it in other words urban flooding is defined as the overflow of water in more densely populated areas or in the developed areas as we all know in urban or developed areas the properties are closely packed so the excess water during rainfall doesn't find huge way or drainage to drain this in turn causes floods in urban areas note that the urban floodings are not only caused by higher precipitation but also due to unplanned urbanization okay see this is the alternative and common definition of urban flooding you can use either of these definitions in your answer okay this is all about the intro part now coming to the body part in the main body of the answer first we have to discuss the causes of urban floods second we have to suggest some practical solutions to tackle urban flooding now first let us see the causes of urban floods now first let us take natural causes as we all know india is a tropical country so it witnesses very heavy rainfall throughout the monsoon season apart from this the coastal areas of india particularly the eastern coasts experiences storm surges due to cyclones here storm surges are nothing but the abnormal rises in sea level caused by the cyclonic winds see this storm surges along with high tides can inundate low lying coastal areas this causing flood in urban zones present along the coasts so this is the first cause that is the heavy rainfall and storm surges secondly india is prone to frequent thunderstorms these thunderstorms can produce intense and short duration rainfall which lead to sudden floods called flash floods the flash floods in turn can lead to urban floods okay this is the second cause that is the frequent thunderstorms thirdly hydrological reasons like overbank flows can lead to urban floods see overbank flows typically occurs when there is an excessive amount of rainfall over a watershed if the rainfall is intense or prolonged rivers and streams can exceed their capacity this leads to overflow of water from river banks and causes flooding in adjacent urban areas okay so these are all some of the natural causes of urban flooding now coming to the man made causes the first main cause is encroachments on drainage channels see due to increased land prices and less availability of land in urban areas new developments have come up in low lying areas of cities like encroachments over lakes wetlands or river beds these activities narrows down natural drains available to drain excess rain water in cities during heavy rainfall times this in turn results in urban flooding the second important cause is poor urban planning see urban areas with inadequate or poorly maintained drainage systems can cause significant challenges during cyclonic storms for example due to poor maintenance of drainage system some of the debris like leaves garbage and sediment can lead to blockage of drains these factors prevent proper water flow and cause urban flooding okay then the third important cause is climate change see the human induced climate change has increased the frequency of short duration heavy rainfall across the world sometimes this leads to high water runoff in urban areas and causes urban flooding fourthly unplanned and sudden release of water from dams and lakes lead to floods in an urban area for example the 2015 chennai floods was caused due to unplanned release of water from chembarambakkam lake situated near chennai 
and finally illegal mining also causes urban flooding see illegal mining of river sand for use in building construction deplete the natural bed of rivers and lakes it causes soil erosion and and reduces the water retention capacity of the water body this phenomenon increases the speed and scale of water flow and causes urban flooding okay so these are all some of the causes of increased urban floods in india now moving on to the second part in the second part we will suggest some practical solutions to tackle urban flooding firstly the government should maintain a proper record of all the water bodies and wetlands at cities this helps to identify illegal encroachments in cities and helps to prevent urban flooding secondly catchment areas of rivers lakes and other water channels should be brought under the protected areas and these areas should also be included in the city development rules this helps to prevent encroachments and urban flooding thirdly in the case of newer developments urban water problems can be studied in broader aspect to mitigate future floods in the city fourthly flood vulnerability mapping also helps to reduce urban flooding flood vulnerability mapping involves the identification of vulnerable areas by analyzing topography and historical data of inundations so these activities can help to reduce floods fifthly watershed management should also be encouraged it includes desilting timely cleaning and deepening of drainage channels see these activities have to be done along the whole river basin instead of just the urban areas apart from this the catchment areas of water bodies need to be maintained well and they should be free from encroachment and pollution so these activities keep the course of water free from obstructions and prevents urban flooding and finally the existing green cover should be protected reforestation and removal of debris from catchment areas can help to prevent soil erosion this in turn reduces the urban flooding okay so these are all some of the possible steps that can be taken to address urban floods now that's all about the body part of the answer now coming to the conclusion see we can conclude the answer with way forwards the conclusion can be like urban areas are important centers of economic activities due to the presence of vital infrastructure so damages to vital infrastructure threatens the overall growth of the country and it even have global implications therefore management of urban flooding should be accorded top priority by the central and state governments some of the sustainable urban planning practices like prioritizing green spaces creating retention ponds and establishing permeable surfaces to absorb and manage storm water can be carried out to prevent urban flooding in addition to this avoiding constructions in the flood prone areas and preserving natural drainage systems can also help to prevent urban flooding okay so this way you can conclude the answer and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion through the mains answer rating approach we saw the causes of urban flooding and we also saw some steps to prevent urban flooding now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this article is taken from 3rd december newspaper as we all know the united nations climate change conference that is the cop28 is happening in dubai in this meeting a group of countries termed the basic countries had stressed to include the failures of the developed nations in the global stock taking exercise this is the crux of the news article given here now in this discussion let us learn some points about global stock take and about basic countries now first let us see what is global stock take see global stock take is nothing but an assessment of climate change action carried out by the world countries basically the global stock take evaluates the progress made on climate action at the global level note that the global stock take is mandated by article 14 of the paris agreement 2015 as we all know through the paris agreement the world nations agreed to limit the global temperature from rising beyond 2 degrees celsius above pre-industrial levels by the end of this 21st century apart from this the countries also agreed that they will try to limit the increase in global temperatures below 1.5 degree celsius as far as possible see these goals are only enshrined in the paris agreement so to track the progress of these goals the world countries have agreed to periodically review their efforts in containing greenhouse gas emissions 
this reviewing mechanism is what is called as global stock take so the global stock take evaluates the progress made on climate action at the global level by doing this the global stock take helps the world countries to identify overall gaps in achieving the paris agreement goals note that the first global stock take is taking place in the current year and it will be conducted once every 5 years hereafter as friends we will cover the important points from the current stock take in the upcoming discussions as i mentioned just now the first global stock take is taking place in the current year so in this slide discussions on global stock take were made on the cop28 summit in such discussions the basic countries said that the global stock take should also account for the failures of developed nations in containing greenhouse gas emissions apart from this kenya also confirmed demand of basic nations okay so this is all about the global stock take now before concluding our discussion let us see in brief about basic grouping basic is a grouping that consists of four newly industrialized countries namely brazil south africa india and china it was formed by an agreement in november 2009 the main aim of the group is to work together in order to fight against climate change the group also has common goals on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and raising the fund to combat climate change okay so this is all about basic grouping and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some points about what is global stock take and then we saw some points about the basic grouping now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion Look at this news article. This article is taken from 3rd December newspaper. This article talks about the global initiative of academic networks that is GIAN. See this particular initiative was discontinued during the COVID-19 pandemic. But now the Union Human Resource Ministry has decided to restart the fourth phase of GIAN. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this discussion let us understand some important points about global initiative of academic networks that is GIAN the GIAN was launched in 2015 it is a program of ministry of human resource and development government of india the primary objective of the GIAN scheme is to provide an opportunity for indian students and faculty to interact with the best academic and industry experts from all over the world by doing this the scheme aims to enhance the quality of education and research in indian academic institutions now let us understand the key components of gian scheme under the scheme the international experts or faculties are invited to provide guest lecture or training in select indian institutions sometimes they are also invited to conduct short term courses in select indian institutions the duration of such course may vary from 1 week to 3 weeks here note that apart from the students of hosting institutions the students from other institutions are also encouraged to participate in the lectures or courses by carrying out these activities the gian scheme enables the international experts to share their expertise and experience to the indian students this motivates the indian students to work on specific problems and to arrive at significant solutions this in turn strengthens the scientific and technological capabilities of india okay here note that the foreign exports participating in the gian scheme will receive an honorarium to cover their travel and other expenses okay so to sum it up the gian is a scheme that aims to improve higher education in india by enabling indian students to interact with best international academicians or scientists or experts okay and that's all regarding this discussion and this discussion is about the global initiative of academic network scheme that is the gian scheme now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions as parents today we are having three questions i will solve two of them and one will be a quiz question for you look at the first question this question is regarding world meteorological organization that is wmo here three statements are given we have to find how many of the statements are correct look at the first statement it does not forms part of the united nations system see this statement is incorrect the wmo is a specialized agency of the united nations okay 
Now coming to the second statement, it is headquartered at Nairobi, Kenya. See this statement is also incorrect. As you saw in the discussion, the WMO is headquartered at Geneva, Switzerland. Now coming to the third statement, it releases the status of the World Climate Report. See this statement is correct. As we saw in the discussion, the WMO releases two reports namely Greenhouse Gas Bulletin and Status of the World Climate Report. Here only one statement is correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A only one. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding basic group. Here two statements are given. We have to find which of the statements are correct. Look at the fourth statement. It consists of five members namely Brazil, India, China, South Africa and Australia. See this statement is incorrect. The basic group consists of four countries namely Brazil, India, South Africa and China. It does not include Australia. Okay. Coming to the second statement, it aims to improve trade and strategic relationship between the members. See this statement is incorrect. The main aim of the group is to work together in order to fight against climate change and not to improve trade and strategic relations. Here both the statements are incorrect. So the correct answer for the question is option D, neither one nor two. This is a good question for you today. I will post this good question in your community section. Try to answer it. And displayed here is the main question for your practice. Go through the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you found our video to be useful, do like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.